Hi, my name is Ellen and I'm the Interpretation Manager at the MAC and today for our behind the scenes video we are looking back at the Spokane Symphony Anniversary Exhibition Music Finds a Way. Today we will be talking with Jim Kirshner, the author and historian who recently published a book documenting the history of the Spokane Symphony. He will be highlighting some of the most important points throughout its history with us today. In the gallery, they put together, based on your research, a timeline here, and you told me that there are four moments that stood out throughout the timeline of the symphony. Yes, and uh, the first one would be in 1945, when Harold Paul Whelan arrived in Spokane from Tacoma in Seattle. He was a very, very accomplished musician and conductor. He had been with the Home Philharmonic in the Seattle Symphony. And his wife was from Spokane, and when he came to visit Spokane, he realized that Spokane was really right for its own professional symphony orchestra. And the reason he said that was because for the decades before that, Spokane had, had symphony orchestras, but they never lasted. Uh, they sprang up, usually lasted three or four or five years, but you know, it was really hard to sustain it, mostly for financial reasons. It's a very expensive cultural endeavor. There's a, you have to pay a lot of people and organize. There's a lot of logistics involved in it. And you have to have a base of talent, very skilled, trained musicians. He realized that Spokane had the skilled and trained musicians, or at least he hoped he was right about that. And what he realized was that it was the organization and financial part of it that was really important. And so he was very good, not just good musically, but he had a, a pretty savvy plan to get the community behind this and organize it and fund it. And so in 1945, he announced, he, he assembled a board and announced that he was going to do this. And he called auditions and in three, it, it, a lot of people in Spokane told him, oh, it'll never work. We've tried it. It's always failed. It's never going to work. Well, and within three months of announcing it, they played their first concert in December 1945. People loved it. It was just a huge social event as well as a cultural event. Um, they played a whole series that, that season. It was such a success, they kept going, they kept going, they kept going, and they kept going until basically today, where they still exist. On Hayes right now, but still exist, and still are the premier cultural institution in Spokane, and, ha and has been for basically its entire existence. Um, after that, the next big event was in 1974, when the Expo, uh, the World's Fair, Expo 74. And this was a huge event for the orchestra because um, Expo brought in a whole bunch of, of classical musicians and institutions, the Los Angeles Philharmonic, um, Cleveland Orchestra, so the big, some of the biggest orchestras in the world, biggest conductors in the world, biggest performers in the world. But they needed an orchestra to, to perform a whole lot of other things. For, for instance, to back some of these major artists like uh, It's at Pearl and the most famous violinist in the world, um, for instance, and but just many other things. And the orchestra ended up playing 20 concerts during Expo 74, and it really brought them from being kind of a local regional orchestra to being more of a national orchestra because they had to work with all these national and international artists and they had to work up to that standard. And it made a huge difference. And after Expo, that experience gave them the sweep they needed to be a really high class orchestra. Then the next event was probably in 1984. They had a, there was a lot of turmoil. I mean, one thing about the history of the Spokane Symphony that I might be writing the book is that there was a lot of turmoil. It was not all easy. There were strikes, there were mutinies by musicians against conductors, there was all kinds of drama. 
And in 1984, one of the crises came to a head, and they needed to bring in a conductor to basically heal the, heal the institution, heal the orchestra. And they brought in a name that basically astonished the whole classical music world. They brought in Gunther Schuller, who would go on to win a prize, was easily, one, he was the um, head of the uh, Tanglewood. Uh, music festival, one of the most famous music festivals in the world. And, um, and he had been to Spokane earlier to be a guest conductor, and he loved it. He thought, this is what I want to do. And they asked him if he would be the interim conductor, and to their, basically their astonishment, he said yes, even though he had all these other things going on. He's, he, I mean, among other things, he's a world-class composer. Um, and so he came in and immediately gave them this uh, the status that you know the rest of the classical music world in the United States recognized. What that I mean, Gunther Schuller is going to come and be the conductor. There must be something there, and it really did. It gave a huge boost of confidence to the musicians who were just in awe of him. I mean, a lot of them studied him in school. Probably. Um, and he, uh, so he came and basically calmed everything down, elevated the musicians to a higher level, basically made the community realize, wow, we really do have something here. So the final uh, turning point was, was in the 2000s, and this, last, this is a turning point that lasted seven years. Um, this was the, the purchase and renovation of the Fox Theater. Um, they bought it in the year 2000 uh, because it was, I mean, it was, it was scheduled to be demolished. And it, it's an amazing building. It's an art deco gem. It had gone from being this grand movie palace in the 30s to, uh, by, the, by the 2000s, uh, it was a discount movie house that had been chopped up into little theaters and um, it was a mess, you know, it was decrepit. All the artwork was still there, but it was all tarnished. Um, and they, uh, uh, it's, it's a local institution that bought it, but with the purpose of tearing it down and making a party line. And the symphony and other people, well, you know, people who were interested in, um, you know, Historic preservation and just rallied around it and helped the symphony buy it. Well, they bought it for a million dollars, but the problem is it was so decrepit they needed to raise another 30 some million dollars in order to fix it up into a world class performing hall. They had actually played in the Fox in their earlier decades, sometimes, never their long term home. They, it was their home for a few years here and there back in the 50s and um, in the 60s. Uh, but it really wasn't a great venue. I mean, it was built as a movie hall, essentially. And in order to turn it, well, first, in order to renovate it from its decrepit state, but also to turn it into a really fine acoustical hall, they needed to spend a lot of money. They ended up costing over $30 million. And it took seven years, but they pulled it off. And it is now, the Spokane Symphony is one of the few orchestras anywhere in the country to own their own hall. And definitely, one, I mean, uh, there aren't any that are the size of Spokane. So it was a major, major risk, a major uh, achievement for them to do it. And it worked. I mean, the, the, the acoustics in that hall are just fantastic. And it immediately made the orchestra better. All the musicians will testify that in their old place at what was originally called the Spokane Opera House, which was built for Expo 74, they couldn't hear each other. It was like playing in, a, in an airplane hangar. Um, and the audience couldn't hear everything either. But at, Fox, all of a sudden they realized what they, what they had been missing. 
and um, the conductor at the time, Gar Foy, um, said, you know, every every musician wants that fine instrument, that Stradivarius. Well, the Fox Theater is this orchestra of Stradivarius. And so now they own their, their own hall and perform there. Um, I know hope that they can 